All right, while we're waiting for AB to start up, my name is Dr. AB. I'm covering for Dr. Og for Monday, today, and Wednesday. So over these two days, we're going to be going over a yeast complementation assay. In particular, we're going to go over some classic experiments that led to the elucidation of proteins involved in the cell cycle. So things we'll be going over is yeast, why yeast are a pretty awesome system to do biology in. So both my PhD and my postdoc focused on yeast. The first was chromatin structure followed by DNA replication, which is intimately tied to the cell cycle. We can go over how complementation works. Um, the advantage of utilizing yeast because they have a haploid and a diploid stage of their life cycle. So just in general, pretty interactive. So hopefully you guys are fairly interactive. Everyone had coffee this morning. What's the advantage of using a haploid organism? First off, what is a haploid organism? One in, right? So you only have one copy of every gene. So from a practical standpoint, why is that cool? Can you make a change to it, that automatically shows up? Right, right. So any mutation has to be expressed, right? So you're going to see that mutation in the phenotype, right? Whereas a diploid, if your mutation is recessive, right, you're not going to see that mutation. So between going different phases of the life cycle, you can take advantage of both of those things, OK? I'm going to cover temperature sensitive mutants or conditional mutants. The advantage of that. The other thing we're going to talk about a little bit is why, how to work with essential genes. So here's a problem working with haploids, organisms that occur in haploids. What happens if you make a mutation in an essential gene? Pretty easy. Dead, right? Dead is hard to study, right? That's not a good situation to figure out what's going on. So we want to figure out if we have a dead, can we make a conditional mutation? Right? So under certain conditions, you can observe the phenotype. Right? But under other conditions, it's fine. That way you can propagate this organism that has this mutation. Does that make sense to everyone? So we're going to that in more detail. And then finally, we'll go over cell cycle mutants. So does everyone remember the cell cycle? Hopefully. That's, I have some of you guys. <laughs> so, all right. So yeast. All right, so yeast are single cell fungi, yeast are eukaryotes. That's a huge advantage of why they've been a major research organism, okay? Two major types that get studied in biology. The first is budding yeast, that's on your left. And the second is fission yeast, okay? So Saccharomyces cerevisiae or Saccharomyces pompei are the two. Um, so that's common ancestor about a billion. So even though they're both yeast, fairly divergent. Right? And there's other yeast, if you're a big yeast aficionado, there's a lot of other guys really. These are the two major research we're getting. So why should you guys care about Saccharomyces cerevisiae? Why would you guys care about it more than probably research biologists who would care about it? Beer. Beer, bread, wine, all alcohol, right? You have to ferment stuff. It's that fermentation pathway, which hopefully you guys all remember from cellular respiration, right? Yeast. It produces ethanol that we enjoy. Okay? Things that make take beer taste good also come from the yeast. So. All right. I'm probably going to keep going on this side. Sorry. It's easier for me to interact. So why are they important organisms experimentally? They grow rapidly. So cell cycle in yeast under optimal conditions is about 90 minutes. Okay? So do you guys know what the cell cycle for a human cell is on average? Looking at about a 24 hour period to go from one cell to two cells in mammalian cells. Inexpensive to grow. It's always a plus when you're doing research. Easy to manipulate in the lab. Non-pathogenic, we've all been exposed to yeast. To the point that people have thought about expressing proteins in yeast for immune response systems. So all the way from AIDS or HIV proteins that would be on the HIV virus. If you can express those in yeast, you can erase immune response. So it's a good overall research organism. Can be made in haploid state, which we've already talked about today. So the other cool thing is yeast 
Saccharomyces cerevisiae was the first full genome to be sequenced. So probably about the time when you guys were like two or three. 96. Is that about two or three? Somewhere there? Like six, six, years, yeah. six years. Six years old? All right. It's nice to have upperclassmen. It feels old. All right. Yeah. So 1996. It was the first full eukaryotic genome we had sequenced. So to give you guys kind of an idea of where biology is, where genetics is, there's about, give or take, 6,000 genes in yeast. Right? We know about 4,000 what they do. So that means there's still genes in the yeast genome that we know make a protein that just have this generic identifier. We don't have a phenotype. We don't know how they're contributing to the cell. So to give you guys an idea of how far we have to get. This is the sequence we've had the longest. Other really cool things, the yeast field, since it was the first organism to be sequenced, there is a collection of yeast knockout genes. So knocking out all non-essential genes, right? And so you can tell the phenotypes for all the non-essential genes. Then you get to the essential genes. So what's the problem with an essential gene? You knock it out, you're dead, right? It's also how they define all the essential genes, okay? 20% um, of the genes are necessary for growth on glucose-rich media, okay? So you might hear me slip and just kind of refer to it as YEPD. Yeast extract, peptone, and dextrose, so glucose, okay? And that's the yeast-rich media. So this is kind of the, the first concept I'm going to go over for you guys will be complementation in the histidine pathway and how you can order the genes on the histidine pathway using genetics. And that would be comparing a synthetic complete, so a media that everything is defined, and histidine is dropped out, and a, compared to YPD, okay? So once again, there, that gives you that conditional mutation, right? So in minus his, if you have a mutation in the biosynthetic pathway for histidine, what do you expect? So I have a yeast, I have, I mutated it, and I know I mutated something in the histidine biosynthetic pathway. I'm telling you histidine is essential for life, and I grow it in an environment where I've given it no histidine, what's going to happen? It's going to die. It's going to die. All right, so we're all this death. Now, in YPD, what's going to happen? YPD is nutrient-rich. It's going to have histidine. Obviously, it's going to live, okay? So that's the conditional right there, right? You've been able to propagate it on YPD and select on minus his for mutations in the pathway. Does that make sense, everyone? Excellent. We'll get more detail about that. This is a great resource, especially for genetics. I'd say yeast is probably one of the, well, there's your genetic Organism. What all have you guys talked about? So kind of coming in green, I guess. But yeast, Drosophila, C. elegans is pretty good. Not as good. The other ones, RNAi. Have you guys talked about RNAi yet? Like really genetics for human cells. So basically, being able to knock down genes in humans. So we'll get to that maybe a little bit. But this website here. I recommend any of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genes we're going to talk about today. If we have time towards the end of class or Wednesday, I'll actually go to this genome browser and let you guys kind of explore. But you can go to any gene. You can look at all its genetic interactions, all its physical interactions, basically everything that's known about the gene. So. All right. Yeast life cycle. We don't have a ski pole or anything, but I can just point. All right, so you can go haploid or diploid, okay? Haploids are gonna come in two flavors, and the flavors of haploids are mat A, and it's just the mating type, or mat alpha, okay? Mat A and mat alpha can come together and through conjugation and form a diploid, okay? You can maintain Saccharomyces cerevisiae as a diploid, right? So 2N copy of DNA, or a haploid, and then you can go in between. Okay, so if you think a gene is essential, right, what you could do is you could actually knock out that gene in the diploid condition, right, by homologous recombination. Does that make sense to you guys when I say homologous recombination? All right. Yes. <laughs> it's always good when I get a yes. All right, so by homologous recombination, yeast is really good at it. 
So you can put a gene marker to knock out the gene of interest in the diploid. Then you're going to be heterozygous in that gene. Does that make sense to everyone? Then you can go through a process called sporulation. So putting these diploids on nutrient, um, basically reduced nutrient media, it's potassium acetate usually, sporulating on it. And you're going to get four spores. Obviously, you guys are all basic genetics. You're going to get two A's and two alphas. And you're going to go back to haploids. So these spores are actually to the size that you can dissect them physically. So this is what we call a tetrad. And utilizing a yeast microscope, you can separate these guys and select four mutations. So, let's go back to the example. Let's say I take that diploid and I mutate a gene that I think is essential, right? I sporulate my diploid and then I separate my spores. If that gene is essential, what should be my viability of my spores? Okay, so in the diploid, I've only made mutation in one copy of the gene. 50%, right? Does that make sense to everyone? So homologous recombination, although it happens at a high rate in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the chances of you changing out both of your alleles are really low. Okay, so you're only going to get one. You're going to select for that. And when you sporulate, you would see half of these guys would be lethal. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Pombi. So, Pombi, I'm not going to spend as much time on Pombi. It's kind of the, I would say, for every 10 Psychomaxi Service CA labs, there's a Pombi lab. Um, some aspects, Pombi is more like eukaryotes, more like higher eukaryotes, like you can be, some ways different. But this is the life cycle here. You can maintain a haploid cycle, <clears throat> or you can get conjugation, form a zygote, go to a diploid cycle. The ASCIS has basically the spores. So this is meiosis and sporulation, and then go back. So you can maintain a haploid and diploid state. Okay? So talk about that just briefly. Alright, so in yeast, you can either be 1N or 2N, right? So if you fertilize two 1Ns, right? So you're MAT A, MAT alpha in the case of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You now form a diploid, you're now 2N, right? And then you go meiosis or gametogenesis, spore, sporulation, is what we referred to it so far. You're going to go back to the haploid state. Okay? So just what we talked about. Is everyone good? You guys can ask questions as you go. You can ask, yeah, you have a few of these people. Whitney will say that I'm not too mean, right? He won't eat you. <laughs> that sounds. I eat people, yes. All right. So, obviously, if you can make a mutation in a haploid, that mutation is expressed, right? So any mutation you make in a haploid cannot be lethal. Does that make sense to everyone? So give me an example when you could make a mutation in a haploid where it might be lethal under certain conditions. So let's say I'm growing that haploid versus on YPD. Or I'm growing that haploid on synthetic, complete, minus, um, tryptophan. Right. So if I've made a mutation that's important in that metabolic pathway for tryptophan, right? You break it. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, if I made that same mutation in a diploid, right, would it grow on YPD, of course, right? Would it grow on tryptophan? Maybe not well. So here's, we're going to think about, for simplicity's sake, to start off, we're going to think of mutations as recessive, okay? So that it would grow on tryptophan, right? And that you can compensate with just one gene copy. Now, being genetics, you guys know that's not always the case. Biology is more complex than simple cases, but we start with a simple case, okay? So that would be masked, in this case, by the dominant allele, or the wild type allele. Alright. So, Pombi is useful because it likes to exist in the one in state, haploid states. They do summate, but then they go through meiosis really quickly. And then later, ask this, you can identify where things are. So sorry about that, that's a little bit. And then the yeast life cycle, same thing, just to reiterate, I think we've covered that pretty well. 
All right. So meiosis, heterozygous can be used to produce one in organisms that display the lethal phenotype. So if you had that diploid and trip, right? So let's go back to that example. We have a mutation in the tryptophan biosynthetic pathway. And now we go through sporulation, meiosis. Our four spores, how many of them will be able to grow on minus trip synthetic complete media? Two. All right. You guys? All right. No problem. Sorry if I'm too, this is too slow, too, too fast. Probably too slow so far. You guys are a little bit quicker on the uptake than the Bio 1 students. All right. <laughs> You're like, I'd hope so, right? <laughs> All right. So imagine you find a yeast chain laboratory that spontaneously mutated to grow unless you provide a histidine. Okay? So if something's not growing on histidine, what's going to be your hypothesis in that mutation? So it doesn't grow if there is histidine. Doesn't grow in the absence of histidine. Okay. Yeah, so. So you, you screwed up something in the histidine biosynthetic pathway, right? All right. So let's, let's complicate this a little bit. Let's say back in the day, you guys were interested. I don't know. The most exciting thing you could think to work on was histidine biosynthesis or amino acid biosynthesis. How do you guys make mutations in organisms? How is it done? Do you guys know? Radiation. Radiation, you can make mutations. What's another one? Chemical mutagenesis. So I found out this is going to be a little aside, but I think it's quite funny. So, what? <laughs> You're like, prepare, is that what you said? <laughs> when he... Dr. Ob calls them commercial breaks when he just like rambles about something. <laughs> commercial break. I like that. I like that. That's a good way to go. All right. So, GMOs, everyone's heard of GMOs, right? So does anyone like grapefruit in here? I kind of I kind of hate grapefruit, but whatever. I'm not not judging grapefruit, right? So it turns out grapefruit in natural state, it's like a mating between two, I don't know what's made, it's made of Barbados or something originally. But normally it has this like white fleshy color, a light fleshy color. You guys have probably all seen the like the dark ruby red grapefruit. Is anyone following this? And anyway, I guess when they got that phenotype, they irradiated grapefruit. <laughs> so now, I mean, so you have people up there that are upset about GMOs, right? Radiation is natural. So in all labeling things, you could label this all natural, right? They radiated and selected for things that had that dark ruby red color. They have no idea what they mutated, right? But that's totally okay. Right? Now you get to the point where you're changing genes that you understand or know something about, and people flip out. So just to give you guys kind of a heads up, it's not something that's new, it's been going on for a long time. I'd much rather change one gene than a gene I know what I changed. All right. So independently, you discover a mutant which has spontaneously arisen in your laboratory. Okay. So you have two histidine mutations, right? They're both in the haploid state. They both can't grow on histidine. Now, question is, you take those two histidine mutations and you mate them together. So let's say we lucked out and one's mat A and one's mat alpha, right? So now you have a diploid. Question is, will they be able to grow on minus his synthetic complete media or will they not be able to grow? Ah, what does it depend on? It's two different spots. Like, yeah. There's A, one B, C, one D, and one spot. Right. If you knock out B on one and then C on another, well, one will have C, the other one will have B. So just sort of. Excellent. Excellent. So, if you knock out if both these mutations in histidine biosynthesis occur in the same gene, will they grow as a diploid? No. Right? There's no wild type copy to give you histidine biosynthesis. They occur in two different spots in the pathway you're going to be fine, right? So this is the concept of complementation. Does that make sense? All right, so we're going to take it a little bit further. So now we can complement, yay, we can grow minus his synthetic complete. What happens if you want to try to order that system? Okay, so let's say you can identify certain intermediates in that biosynthetic pathway. I don't know what they are, we can look them up if we want, but there's intermediates, right? You start with something, you end up with this unit, okay? 
Now, you want to say, does your one mutation, let's call it mutation A, mutation B, which one comes first in that pathway, right? If they're in the same pathway, right, you can order them. Does that make sense? Because you can add certain things back and get where they're going on the pathway. So this is called epistasis. You guys heard this term before? Is this a new term? Okay, so it's a new term. So epistasis analysis is do two genes occur in the same pathway or do they occur in two different pathways? Does that make sense? And you're just trying to order, and epistasis allows you to order genes in a pathway. Okay, so you'd be looking to say, if I have A and B mutation, right? So you went through a diploid, you got a score that you knew had both mutations, let's say these mutations were marked somehow, right? Or just by tracking your spores, that which could grow and just mean which could not, you could tell whether or not you got single mutations or double mutations. Does that make sense to everyone? You guys want me to draw that out? That's kind of a. I'm going to draw that out real quick. All right, so you have a. You have. We'll call this a tetrad, right? There's four spores after meiosis. And as meiosis completes, right, you'll have these four spores. And if they all, and this is just histidine, do they grow in meiosis plates? If they can all not grow, right, you know that they each got one mutation. Does that make sense? Because to make this spore, you had a mutation in A and a mutation in B, right? And these are both haploids. Does that make sense? So the only way that all four would not grow on minus case is if this was distributed equally, right? However, if you got a case where you saw something like this, right, in the spores, what could you tell me about these two spores? What? Well, they're never going to grow. They'll grow on YPD, right? So this is on minus histidine plates, right? They'll grow on YPD. But how many mutations in the histidine biosynthetic pathway do these guys have? Because these are both wild type, right? So that's the, do you get everyone to make sense on that? Okay, because we're back at haploid here. So we went to diploid, then we sporulated, back to haploids, okay? And you can compare this double mutant to either single mutants, right? If you can find the metabolic intermediates, right? Compare where the double mutant does it compare to the metabolic intermediates found in mutation in B or mutation in A. It allows you to order those two genes. Is everyone on board with that? All right, so the strains have the same mutation in the same gene. Kind of covered that. Sorry, I get ahead of my slides sometimes. You guys get double the, double the information there, right? All right, so how complementation works. We've created cells with one inner strains, mated them together. Phenotype of the two in organism, they're on the same mutation. Obviously, you're going to have the mutation in your diploid. If they're different mutations, you're not going to have the phenotype in your diploid. Does that make sense? If the mutations in the same gene, right, die. If the mutations in a different gene, you're alive. Hopefully, that makes sense. We could search a large number of yeast strains and able to grow on his and then cross the strains together, right? So this is what classically is going to be called complementation groups. So when people do mutagenesis and they say they're interested in, I don't know, what's your favorite amino acid biosynthetic pathway? We'll stick with histidine because we're using it. <laughs> Who doesn't love histidine? All right, so you've isolated I don't know, 100, 200 mutants, right? That's a lot to work with. But what you can do with those mutations is you can do complementation analysis and give them into complementation groups, right? So let's say there's 10 genes in the biosynthetic pathway and you've got all the genes represented. That means out of those 200, they'll be into 10 groups, right? Either they can complement or they can't. Does that make sense? So now instead of dealing with 200, you only have to deal with 10 things. How is you guys? PCR going and floating good? Yeah. <laughs> a little all over the place. Okay. So then you can determine which traits have mutations in the same gene, which ones have different genes, right? So you brought everything down to complementation groups. Now, just because they're in the complementation group, does that mean they have the same mutation? 
Yeah, it just means the same genes mutated, right? So actually, if you look at this in the cell cycle field, um, when we get more into it, they isolated multiple mutations in the same gene. A lot of times it occurs in the same gene, we'll the same exact mutation, and we'll cover why that would be. And it's basically the mutation you were asking for was highly specific. We can talk about that in more detail. All right, so everyone's good with complementation. Any questions? All right, so let's just review the cell cycle. Pretty straightforward, right? G1, S phase, all right, synthesis. And then you're gonna go through either mitosis or meiosis, right? So let's just focus on mitosis here. You have spindle pole body duplicating in yeast. So centrioles are spindle poles in yeast. And you're gonna separate your chromosomes into two cells, right? Attachment to the mitotic spindles, go through telophase, and cytokinesis, and you end up with two doctor cells. Pretty straightforward, everyone remembers this, right? So now, the question is, if you're a geneticist, how do you approach this problem in figuring out what genes play a role in controlling the cell cycle? So let's just take a step back. In general, what do geneticists do? Cool. They kind of just want to say mess with stuff. They like to make mutations, right? Yeah. And they like to make mutations in complex systems. Right? And they like to try to understand how that mutation plays out. Right? So today, for biology, geneticists and biochemists and microbiologists and chemical engineers and all those guys, you have to be able to do interdisciplinary. You can't get away with being, I'm a biochemist, I'm a geneticist. It doesn't work. Okay? So the geneticist approach is make a mutation, figure out what happens. Right? The problem with that is you made a mutation in a really complex system, and you have to work through and figure out what's going on, right? Just because you have a mutant that affects it doesn't tell you exactly what it's doing, right? But it's a start. Now, a biochemist, what's a biochemical approach to a biological problem if you're a classic biochemist in the classic sense? Break open the cell, purify something, and see how, how little it can Biochemists like to reconstitute systems, right? So it's probably more of an engineering. You guys like everything fairly controlled. As biologists, we're a little bit more artistic, so we're okay with a little bit of crazy. Where if you're a biochemist, you've isolated everything, you've purified it, and you've reconstituted the system. So very simplified, right? Mostly in vitro. And you have to work in a cold room a lot, which isn't fun. So. The geneticists are going to say genetics is better because you're doing it in vivo, it's in the cell, and you're making the mutation where everything else is going on, right? You live in a complex world. You don't live in a world of just a few things. All right. So just to remind you guys of the yeast life cycle, this is going to be important. Um, today we're going to break out, and I'm going to have you guys come up with strategies to figure out the cell cycle in yeast what we've talked about. And I just want to give you guys a quick hint. All right, so why was budding yeast chosen as a great experimental system to understand the cell cycle? Anyone know? The answer's on the slide, so it's not that difficult. Oh, it's carefully coordinated. It's carefully coordinated with what? on the right track. You guys can help him out. What's so. so what's the bud in budding yeast telling you? So I can look at a budding yeast under a microscope and I can tell you exactly where it is in the cell cycle. Does that make sense? So the reason it was chosen, the reason it works really well Let's take a guess. Where do we think this is at in the cell cycle? And the blue here is DAPI stain DNA. Okay? It's just a fluorescence that will bind to double strand of DNA. Okay? So if I was to ask you guys where in the cell cycle you think this guy is, where would you tell me?
So a cell wants to go from one cell to two cells, right? Cell division. So obviously we have one cell here, right? So if you guys were to guess where this is at in the cell cycle, what would you say? It's in the interface, it's in G1, okay? So the cool thing about yeast is there's what's defined as start, and this wasn't known before all the cell cycle experiments were done, right? This place start, and three things, three major things happen in the cell cycle in yeast. One is you replicate your genome. That's pretty obvious, right? The other is you duplicate your spindle pole bodies. Okay, so remember spindle pole bodies are just centrals. Okay, same thing. Third, you butt, right? So if you guys follow this through, you can tell that this bud that's growing here is going to become a daughter's cell, right? And you can see that the DNA mass goes from one DNA mass to two DNA masses, right? So you can tell where you're at in the cell cycle. So just by visualizing these cells under a microscope, staining in DNA, you can tell where you're at in the cell cycle. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? So everyone can see why it was a really powerful system to explore the cell cycle. So here's the other question. And hopefully this this isn't some people struggle with this. It's cheese. Why do we care? I mean, it's a single cell organism. It makes beer, which is awesome, but why do we care? Because there's more single cell life than anything else that kind of important. <laughs> single cell life is important. We don't want to like, you know down the single cells, but let's be let's be human centric for a while. Why do we care about yeast being human centric? We're just made up of lots of little cells and they're still doing like similar things. Right. Everything is conserved through evolution. Right? We're not budding. We're not budding, no, we're not budding. We don't get it on with A's or alphas. That's not how we work. It's still similar. Though. But if you look at Simple eukaryotes, right? That's so why it was a powerful and why it was the first genome sequence. It's the simple as eukaryote. All the major things apply to your cells. Okay? So as you get larger eukaryotes, you get more bells and whistles. Right? But the basics are pretty simple. To the point that if you take certain genes from myself, you, put them in yeast, you can get complementation. Pretty cool, right? So that's the that's why we care. And beer is always good. Okay. So let's I don't know how many there those are, but let's go through separating the groups and let's spend the next, I don't know, ten minutes. This goes to fifty after. Alright, this is nice. Usually when it costs like two or three hours, it's forever. It's like boom, boom, done. Alright. So, break up the groups of three or four, whatever you guys like. If you like three people in the class or four people, I don't care. Um, design genetic experiments to identify genes ex that are important for the cell cycle in budding yeast. I want you guys to define what assay you're going to use. Kind of led you down that path, so it's going to be pretty easy. What is the readout for your assay, right? So how are you going to measure whatever you're reading, right? Does that make sense to everyone? How will you work with essential genes? I can tell you, going from one cell to two cells is an essential process. If you don't do it, you're pretty much dead, especially for a single cell organism, right? So, they're essential genes. So you guys have to think, how do you work with essential genes, right? Let's talk about that as a group before I say you guys, uh, how would you work with essential genes? Think about the histidine biosynthetic pathway, right? So you guys, so on the histidine biosynthetic pathway, right, when you're thinking about it, right, you have two conditions, right? You have YPD, they're happy, game busters, good to go, right? No problem. And then you have another situation where there's no histidine in their environment, right? So you guys need to, I'm going to leave this open. We'll see if anyone comes up with it. Don't worry, because I'm going to give you guys the answer and what was historically done. But 
you're going to need some way in which your mutation is conditional. Does that make sense to everyone? Some way that it's alive, some way that it's dead. Okay? So I'll give you guys a hint. Think about what mutations are when they're expressed. So what's the functional unit in the cell, basically? Protein, right? Think about the things that affect proteins. Right? Protein structure, right? So you need that enzyme to function in some cases and not function in others. Right? Which is the level of protein. All right, break up. Try to figure that. Remember, Ted used to hard work with, so separate into like groups of two or three, and then we'll talk about it for the last five minutes. Ready? Go. He's like, I don't like anyone. I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, waiting for the answer. <laughs> yes, because that's how life works. You just sit in your research lab and wait for the answer. <laughs> so you guys can rearrange the test, too. I don't think they're attached to it. Yeah. No. So I'll be wandering around, too, to see if you guys have any questions. <laughs> that's not the answer. So what are some ways that you might be able to separate the protein from a, function, a mutation that functions in the So what affects protein here? Tim, it's very very easy. So you could have a mutation, right? So I'll tell you the temperature of yeast love is 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now think about a like, mutation that might be like that. Right, right. So, what happens when you raise the temperature? Right, so kinetic energy. So, you actually probably actually have to say, we throw a certain temperature. So, now you have a potential mutation. As long as you grow it at that permissive temperature, it's fine. Does that make sense? So, that's like So, what else could you use? I mean, that was just a little shit. I was just like, I was messing with it and then seeing it was alive. Right? You know, my husband made the structure. So, here's the other question. And this is also very cool. Do you think you could only add up instead of having a little bit of a structure? Do you also have to have a little bit of a structure? Also, the result was a yellow set of ones. Very good. So, yeah, there are both. So now having that, figure out how you figure out the cell cycle, assay, all that stuff. How's the group going here? Like, that's like everyone I've ever known. Mm. Right, so you have to have, you have to be able to propagate this, right? So you're looking for a conditional allele. So you're going to make mutations in the genes. And you want a situation in which you can only maintain them to study them. Then you want another condition where you can change them. Well, think about what affects protein structure. So that's you guys are right. So think about the assay and how you would measure that. Okay. All right. How are you guys doing here? Yeah. Well, the final one was one of the why is budding yeast like why is it You can usually tell where it's at in some So your acid can be basically just visual when you're looking at the yeast, right? Where are the Okay, so you got that, right? Now you're going to make mutations, right? 
prominence and big mutation to essentially not very useful, right? So you have to figure out some way that you can use mutation to So think about like what effects protein structure. I'm looking for the pH, temperature, so those are both really good. Okay, so, so the other thing that some people use sometimes is they'll use specific inhibitors, but they can add the inhibitor, not take the inhibitor. Okay, so this kind of next generation. I'll tell you who we are. Okay, so think about your assay, how your assay would work, and then how you make the mutations. Okay? I would just change it in a ton of ways and then work on that kind of my <laughs> Somehow this does not sound like genetics back no, there. No, we found it! Literally, we're days was awesome. <laughs> no, no, if we saw so, uh, it, no one. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, where it is in just cell cycle. Yeah, and then how do we work with the that's a good thing. Um, so you want to see a little bit more general than that, but we can get to it. We'll talk about it. That's good. All right. How's it going over here? Not very well. How was the bathroom? Was it nice? <laughs> All right. We have a theory that you just like change. Whoa, you guys can pick up. Can you not just like change something and then if it dies, you just don't get the work? <laughs> yeah, so you can, you can make a mutation and then it dies, right? But the thing is, you can never isolate that mutation back out. So you never know what you made a mutation. There's a, there's a lot. If you just keep doing it and then if it dies, you know it doesn't work. And then try something new. Actually, if it dies, you can isolate the DNA. Awesome. And then you can run back through the genome so, okay. <laughs> this is, this is pre-PCR here, right? If we're, if we're dead, we're dead. So, all right. Let's take it back to, yeah. All right. So, what do you use? Cell cycle. What's the assay you can use? I know a lot of you guys have the correct answer, so just someone bust out with it. What do you use? What's your assay? <laughs> no, not correct. So, how can you tell where yeast is at in the cell cycle? Where it is Yeah, look at them, right? Microscope. Right? You can tell in our microscope where it's at in the cell cycle. Alright, so what I'm going to tell you, is a little bit more detailed, is that budding, spindle ball duplication, and DNA replication, they're all controlled at start, but then they diverge. Okay, so you can have a mutation in those. So you also want to stain for the DNA. Okay? But your assay would be observing the yeast, right, under a microscope to tell where they're at in the cell cycle. Okay, now, Next question is... Why does that matter where they're at in the cell cycle? Mmm, good question. Why would it matter at where they're at in the cell cycle? Why do you want to know that? Because you have to know where you're at off. Right, so if you make a mutation, right? Say you make a mutation that's in the transition from G1 to S phase. Okay? So the cell regulates when it's going to replicate DNA. Why is that an important point of regulation? Why do we care about that point of regulation quite a bit? You don't want to be around the the genome for no reason. Yes, that's true. One cell is all going to become two cells, but what's the problem with proliferating cells? Probably affected everyone in here. Not personally, but cancer. Cancer, right? So understanding the genes that can control the cell cycle, especially when you decide to replicate or commit to going to two cells, is really important. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. So we have our assay. We're going to observe these cells using a microscope. We're going to stain the DNA so we can tell DNA content and the body. Okay. Now, how are you going to make mutants? Alter the DNA. Okay. So you chemical mutagenesis, you can obtain mutagenesis. There's all kinds of different ways, right? You need to make a library of mutations, right? So you're going to make mutations, and out of thousands and thousands, some will be useful, right? Now. If you make mutations in essential genes, 
what happens to the genes? They're dead, right? So now you have to make mutations in those genes where they only lose function under certain conditions. So what is the condition you guys can utilize to change that function of that gene? Temperature. Okay. So that is a classic experiment. You can make a mutation, right? And you're asking for that mutation. So these mutations are completely random, right? Everyone got that? And you're asking for the mutation to grow at a permissive temperature. In budding yeast, the permissive temperature they used more often than not was 22 degrees Celsius. So yeasts are happiest at 30 degrees Celsius. And the non-permissive temperature was 37 degrees Celsius. So you're asking them to live at 22 degrees and be dead at 37 degrees, right? Okay, so now you've made mutations, they fit your general criteria of being alive at 22 degrees but dead at 37 degrees. So what is temperature doing? Right, so something you've interrupted that amino acid structure in that protein such that the higher temperature is unstable and can no longer do its essential function. Does that make sense? Are all TS mutations going to die at the high temperature? No, right? So there was a really strict cutoff that it was alive and dead, right? Most things are going to get alive and screwed up, right? Alive and dead. Okay, now you have this system and your assay is to look at the yeast cells. How would you do it? So you have the same mutation, right? You look at it at 22 degrees, what do you expect to see in an asynchronously growing culture? Alive. Alive. And what would be the distribution of the yeast in the cell cycle in an asynchronously growing culture? All over the place. All over the place, right? So you would see some small budded cells, some large budded cells, you'd see everything. Does that make sense? Now, you raise the temperature to 37 degrees, right? It's a culture, so you have tons of cells in this culture. You observe them, right? They're all going to be in one spot, right? Does that make sense? Because wherever that gene failed, that's where you're going to stop in the cell cycle. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, so just leave you guys with a quick comment, and then we'll go through the details. This is good, because I wasn't sure how long all this would take. So this was the Nobel Prize in 2001. You guys were like 11. But Lee Harwell, did all the work in budding yeast. Paul Nurse in fish and yeast. These are the two main ones focus on Tim Hunt and sea urchin eggs, mitosis promoting factor. Cyclins, which you guys have probably heard about, was well, more of a biochemical approach. Okay? So, with that, next class we'll go into details of how they actually did it. We got, you guys kind of all got there on your own. We'll go through some of the core details of how everything maps out to the cell cycle. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, no, I did not. So just sort of like, when's your lab? Two o'clock. It just thinks that, the lab, I have keys to the lab to open it if you 